Hey, thanks for the introduction there. Uh, my name, as I mentioned, is Gavin Adams. I'm an IoT Specialist Solutions Architect, and I've been with AWS for a little over six years. And as a Solutions Architect, I work directly with customers to help them understand how to use AWS services. But more importantly, is we like to work back with some customers, understand their business outcomes they're looking to achieve, and having those work on top of AWS. As an IT specialist, I work with our AWS IT set of services. And over time, I've really come to focus more on edge capabilities and around the industrial side. So when I was thinking about you know, a webinar for protecting workers, I thought this really resonated well. So in today's webinar, we're going to cover a few different points. We're going to start off with just a high-level overview of AWS IoT and some of the services and capabilities that it provides. We're then going to start talking a little bit about what is worker safety. So we're going to describe worker safety in a couple of contexts, but also kind of more importantly is how does worker safety kind of evolve over time? We'll then go into a description or discussion around AWS for Industrial. And this is a comprehensive offering made by AWS and our partners to help address all of the industrial use cases that customers have. And we'll focus on the worker safety aspect of how we can use AWS services to achieve a particular outcome, and then we'll demonstrate that. We will have already set up what our worker safety looks like and some of the tools and services to use, and then we'll go through and do a demonstration of object detection. We'll get, the, we'll get that defined in a few minutes for worker safety overall. A couple of things that we won't cover here are some very specifics on a lot of the different services. This is more just to give you an idea and an education for how you can take the concept, worker safety over time, and using data science and edge computing actually achieve this outcome. So with that, let's jump into some of the fundamentals of AWS IoT. When we first came out with AWS IoT back in 2015 as a set of managed services, we wanted to help customers essentially get rid of the undifferentiated heavy lifting of connecting devices at scale to some service, ingesting data, and then making this available. And the way that we worked from this was you know, from one simple question which is, you know, if you did know the state of every device that you have in your organization, and you could get every bit of data from that device into the cloud and work on that at scale, what type of problems could you actually solve using AWS IoT? And we were kind of surprised to see that essentially there was no real one area of, of commonality. Customers were doing things with predictive maintenance, so in the industrial space. They were using this to uh, instrument and make smart buildings and smart cities. Uh, healthcare is, one, is a very large user of IoT for doing both in-hospital and remote patient monitoring. And then one of the other things is around that enhancing the safety of not only the home and the office, but of also industrial sites. So AWS IoT is made up of a variety of different services. And we've kind of categorized these into three categories. Starting at the bottom, we have device software. Device software is essentially the software development kits, or SDKs, all the way up to advanced software, such as AWS IoT Greengrass, which I'll describe in a second, for how you can have your devices connect to AWS IoT. So it provides all of the capabilities for connectivity, uh, retries, storing and persisting data locally. And then we move up into the connectivity control services layer. And from here, essentially, is what we call like the IoT plumbing, if you will. It's the fully managed service capability that allows you to device or to connect devices at scale securely and also be able to have visibility into the status of devices and all of these messages that are being published from a device to the cloud or a cloud down to a device. And then finally, on top of that, when we've got millions of devices sending billions of messages, is we have our analytic services, which again are fully managed services that allow you to take that data in, such as AWS IoT Analytics, which is a fully managed data pipeline to ingest, cleanse, transform, and then make that data available to consumers downstream without any of the heavy lifting of big data applications overall. In today's presentation or webinar, I'm going to, going to focus predominantly on device software, AWS IoT Greengrass, and a little bit in the connectivity aspects when we're talking about AWS IoT. So I just mentioned, you know, AWS IoT Greengrass is one of the mechanisms that we can actually use to extend cloud capabilities out to the edge. And by providing you a software that you run on your own hardware, this allows you know, us to as, as basically address three constraints or laws that we see for you know, connected devices. You know, the first, the laws of physics, is reduced latency. 
with being able to run compute logic locally, you don't have to worry about taking data at the edge, sending it to the cloud, doing some type of inference or computation, and then sending a response back down, which can take, you know, you know, milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds to seconds to actually do. It can all be done locally. Uh, similarly, from an economics perspective, by not sending up irrelevant data, you're only sending up data of interest to the cloud, is you can significantly reduce costs on network circuits that can be very expensive, meaning you could cost optimize for remote locations, which could be like a farm or an industrial site that has got limited connectivity. And then finally, AWS IT Greengrass helps support or address the, the law of the land, which is data sovereignty. If you've got certain situations, either from internal policies and procedures or from reg regulatory constraints, that you can't have data leave a particular location, AWS IT Greengrass can actually operate on that data locally, and you've got full control over where data actually resides and sits. It can stay on Greengrass or it can go to the cloud, but you take full control over that capabilities. So with AWS IT Greengrass, this edge capability is what we're going to be using to actually do the deployment of what we're going to talk about next, which is our um, worker safety overall. Uh, a couple of features of, of Greengrass that we're going to be using is the first one, which is the ML inference or machine learning inference. So this is the ability, and especially when you're using things such as GPU-backed instances or, or hardware, is to run machine learning models at the edge. Predominantly, we see these a lot for computer vision, but it could be for other types of machine learning models. And then container support, the ability to take logic that you've created, which ties in, and marries into the machine learning inference, to actually be able to do things such as take a image or a frame of video, send it to machine learning inference, and then based on the predictions that come back, take some type of local action. But AWS IoT Greengrass does support a lot of other capabilities um, besides those two, but those are the ones we're going to be focusing on. So with that kind of overview of AWS IoT, let's jump into what worker safety is. Um, I took a, took a look at essentially how many types of worker safety incidents and cases have been reported. And this is uh, information from the uh, US Bureau of Labor Statistics back in 2018. And when I took a look initially at all the categories of categories that I'd consider to be industrial IoT for 425,000 plus cases a year of worker safety type of um, incidents. But I kind of actually real, uh, didn't you know, take in consideration, if you take a look at it, uh, just a few lines uh, above that 425 is manufacturing, where there's an additional 430,000 cases, which I think could be directly attributable to, attributable to IoT. And what I guess this kind of means is that worker safety is not only important to ensure that our workers are being safe, but that there's a significant amount of uh, corrective action that we can take to hopefully reduce the amount of cases and potentially get that incident rate down lower across different industries. So when you ask somebody, you know, what is worker safety? You know, what is one of the main things that helps your workers be safe? I think normally everybody's going to start talking about personal protective equipment or PPE. Um, just for terminology, I'll use PPE for the remainder of this uh, conversation. And normally that's going to be, you know, everybody's going to envision a hard hat, a safety vest, and steel toed boots. And this is good for a lot of industrial environments. But if you start to take a look at some other industries, such as healthcare, their concept of PPE is going to be something completely different. We don't worry about hard hats so much, but we definitely want to ensure that our, our frontline healthcare workers are properly masked, glo you know, gloved, and gowned for the environments that they work in. And then there might be other high risk environments or very specific situations where additional PPE above and beyond our typical stuff is necessary. Such in this case where we've got a, a harness to prevent falls along with a respirator for working in abrasive type of environments. But one common type of thing is that when you take a look at a consideration for worker safety, normally we're talking about PPE and, and or a specific job type of category overall. However, there's other ways that we could actually help to protect our workers. One could be fall detection. If we could actually detect when somebody faints or falls and they're in an area that is you know, unmonitored by other people, we could have somebody alerted from our environmental health and safety or EHS staff uh, to come help. It could be from an ergonomic perspective. In warehousing and transportation, the moving and loading and unloading of shipments is probably one of the main contributors to, to worker incidents. 
And if you can detect when a worker has got a proper posture versus something that's going to cause repetitive stress or other types of, of potential problems, is you can help, you know, essentially alert them to say, you know, here's some proper mechanisms to, to help, you know, you know, you know, work better or work safer overall. It could also be from your no-go areas. Uh, normally, if you see this from an industrial customer, such as auto manufacturers with uh, robotic equipment, is that they're always going to be, you know, labeled with, you know, areas that people should never walk because a robot could swing into that area. But if somebody, for whatever reason, you know, trips and falls into an area, or cuts a corner or whatever, is by able to use you know, geofencing or you know, setting up lanes of traffic is we can identify when those types of um, operations are, or um, you know, incorrect operations are taking place and make corrective action. So I kind of, what I want to you know, bring up is that although we, we've got PPE as kind of a commonality, there are numerous other ways that we can help protect our workers uh, through the use of technology. And one of those mechanisms is through machine learning. Machine learning in general is the ability to do chores or tasks which are normally not um, conveyed or are made available for computers. They're, they're hard for computers to do. So this could be using an object detection model where you want to take a, a frame of video and detect all of the objects that are in that particular frame like we've shown here. Uh, from a regular programmatic or computer type perspective, this is very hard to do. But by using advanced algorithms and math, we can actually make um, algorithms or uh, algorithms, uh, machine learning models, which make this very easy to do. It could also be something more complex, which um, in the background might be like a plume dispersion model. This is something that's not going to be visible or give you any type of, of indicator, but it's a way that you can take multiple types of data, such as the location potentially of you know, oil wells across the well field, along with um, historical climate data or wind speed indicators for what a wind field looks like, along with monitors spread out between that field to backtrack to where something such as a methane plume has started to arise so that it can be corrected accordingly. Uh, one of the key things with machine learning is that it's based on probabilities and predictions. It's not a 100% exact science overall, but by applying the proper amount of training and tools is that we can get high probabilities for events taking place, which then can go into our worker safety environments overall. So we talked about a little bit of worker safety. Let's talk about safety over time. And for this example, I'm going to use um, a natural gas extraction site. I live in Denver, Colorado, which is a large area for oil and natural gas extraction. And one of the main ways they do it here is through hydraulic fracturing or fracking. And from this mechanism, you essentially go out to a site and you, know, you find some land, you clear the land, you then set up a drill and you drill vertically for a certain distance and then you start drilling horizontally um, into the to the bedrock around where you want to extract the uh, the resources you then do the hub uh, the well completion which is to inject these um fracking or fracturing uh, chemicals at a high um, pressure to you know, break open and loosen those resources and then put a well head on top of that and then you know that well goes into production for the next 20 to 30 years and then 20, 30 years later, when that, uh, that field has been completely exhausted, you, you know, the companies come back in, remove all the material that is left over, and put the land back into the same state that it's in. And it's interesting because every one of these steps has got different sets of crews and the ways that they actually deal with this. So from a safety perspective, when you're on site doing site preparation, this is where you're going to have you know, workers. So you protect, you know, PPE is going to be something we want to detect, but you're also going to have heavy equipment. You're going to have graders, um, front loaders, back, you know, back hose, et cetera, that are leveling out and making that ground and you know uh, safe. And we want to ensure that you know, people plus heavy equipment you know, don't combine or collide into each other. Once you move into that drilling phase, all the heavy equipment's gone. We don't have to worry about detecting that anymore. But now with a higher staff or a higher amount of staff that's actually on site, we do want to worry about things such as the, those falling type of things. Or if there's material being transferred overhead, is it in a secure way or has something broken loose that could potentially hurt somebody? When we come into the uh, well completion phase, and this is where all the uh, fracturing fluids are being injected, is that we may want to ensure that all of our staff have got proper respirators uh, installed, and that if there's any type of fluid leaks or if they come out, we want to detect those so that we can do a remediation cleanup immediately. When all that's gone and we're in production, we're, we're basically left with just uh, an oil well, 
uh, that's pumping oil or uh, something that's going to get the natural gas out. And for the next 20 to 30 years, it's going to be infrequently monitored and um, inspected. And this is going to be by authorized personnel, either the owners of the actual well site itself or by potentially inspectors or the regulatory people that are going to come on site for periodic um, inspection. So PPE may not be as important, um, but we also definitely do want to include things such as that methane detection again, that plume dispersion model that I spoke about. And then 20 or 30 years later, we're going to have a, a cluster of activity, you know, a beehive of activity for a couple of weeks. While again, equipment comes in, the oil head is capped off, and the land is put back into the, to the natural state that it was left. So as you can see here, we've got essentially five different phases for a particular project, and then we want to have worker safety basically differ over time. Now, if we kind of combine that object detection model that I spoke about along with that particular example, here's a couple, here's a couple examples of what this looks like. So the first one is like on site preparation. We may want to have a object detection model that's looking for heavy equipment and is looking for people. Those are the only two classifications we really need. By understanding what heavy equipment is, and if this is in video, it, you know, we've got, we also have you know, momentum and velocity. And if we have cameras that have got good static points that they know the distance between people and equipment, is that we can make predictions, is our, are people in a safe area or is there the potential for a piece of heavy equipment that could collide with the person overall? When we move into the drilling phase, our model classification slightly changes. We're no longer worried about that heavy equipment, but we're now focused more on the specific aspects of PPE. In this example, we, you know, we have had hard hats, but if this particular oil site uh, required you know, safety vests or the type of equipment, those could also be classifiers that we want to get. But as you can see, we're, we've now changed from one model on site preparation to drilling. And then kind of the, um, you know, the, the, the larger one, if you will, is well completion. As we're actually working with potentially um, you know, caustic or environmentally unsafe chemicals, we want to ensure that all of our staff have got respirators. We're looking for fluid spills. And then also we might want to be able to detect things that are not apparent in the air. So like hydrogen sulfide could come out from this part of the fracking operation is something that's very important to detect, but it's something that's not going to be visible. So we can actually do a combination of data or um, object detection models along with other machine learning models or even just sensor data to help provide you know, better safety for our workers uh, during this particular phase of operation. So we have all these different phases, we have all these different trained models, and we'll get into that in more detail in a few minutes, that we want to deploy to our site. And if we have just a very small amount of sites of, of oil wells or whatever we're looking to, um, to uh, instrument, it's relatively easy to keep track of all of that. I know, you know when a site's in a particular phase, I know which model that I want to deploy and even which version of model that I want to do. But when you start to actually expand this out to hundreds to thousands of locations or things that we're looking to instrument, we want to ensure that we've got mechanisms in place that when we create a model on the cloud side and we've gone through our diligence from a data science perspective to validate and ensure that it's correct, we want to ensure that we've got ways to automate and send this out to a variety of locations. If I have 10, 10 locations that are in the preparation phase and we've decided to add a new particular capability, I want to be able to train that model and maybe go from prepare v3 to v4 and deploy it you know, at scale to everybody else at the same time. And so the ways to do this is obviously to use some of the AWS services in the background. Another thing is also for compelling events. Everything we spoke about so far is around kind of known operations. But as we're kind of aware with the COVID-19 pandemic is that things can be sprung upon us immediately or quickly that we have to take um, corrective action for. So in this particular case, it's showing uh, one of my uh, AWS colleagues who is going through and demonstrating how they did training for different types of face, hand and head cover detection. And this was all used as part of a new service called Amazon Recognition PPE detection. It's a cloud-based service that allows customers to start sending um, images directly into Amazon recognition and getting back immediate results for what's in the, in the actual image. So in this particular case, does everybody have PPE? Yes. And this also includes things such as wearing masks and uh, you know, safety goggles also from this perspective. 
So compelling events are, are interesting because they can happen within a matter of weeks. And if your instrument, if your site has been instrumented for more of a traditional static type of approach, this might be harder to, to deploy. Whereas using things such as object detection models and an iterative approach can make this a, a much faster process. So I'll kind of summarize what we uh, covered in this section here is, you know, every industry is going to have their own requirements and probably all of them are going to go beyond just normal PPE. This is true if you're oil and gas, if you're agriculture with large combines, if you're in energy and you're working in wind turbines, or even just on manufacturing lines with different types of products that are being created. The solutions will change over the course of time or over the projects. As we saw in the uh, natural gas extraction site, different phases have different approaches for how you want to do worker safety. And even, even in that case, one well in a temperate area might have a completely different uh, set of changes for a well in a uh, you know, northern climate where there's a lot more you know, snow and uh, inclement weather. We can also use multiple approaches for how we, we want to do worker safety. Machine learning is a great tool to, to get started and do this, but you can also do similar things with sensors. This could be from you know, detecting if somebody walks into a no-go zone by you know, ultrasonics or that a brake beam sensor has been, you know, been tripped and that you can take an immediate alert. But this can also be combined together to have a very robust worker safety program. And then of course, you know, those compelling events are things that either they're going to change over the course of time. This may be going from you know, PPE that people wear in winter is different than in summer. Or it might be things that are sprung upon us, such as, you know, the pandemic, where we want to take immediate changes to our worker safety uh, detection uh, in a matter of days or weeks, instead of you know, waiting months or a longer period of time. So with that, we understand what you know, worker safety is and how it can kind of change over time. How do we go about actually doing this, though? And this is where AWS for Industrial comes in. So AWS Industrial is a combination of AWS and partner solutions that we put together into a single initiative. These uh, services and solutions are focused around the, the power of using machine learning for common industrial workloads. And we also want to ensure that these address not only greenfield or brand new environments, but also that these, these could be applied to brownfield industrial applications overall. When we start asking customers, you know, what do they do and what, you know, where can they get better efficiencies, it came into a different set of categories. Um, some of these are going to be obvious, such as you know, product and asset optimization. The ability to get you know, better operational equipment effectiveness, or OEE, is important. And obviously, if you're in the manufacturing space, you know, the, uh, the quality of products coming off a of manufacturing line are key and important. And machine learning can help out there from like a computer vision perspective to look for, you know, uh, defects and the accuracy of the products being created. Supply chain, obviously, we're, we're being impacted with that today. And um, these things can help forecast and allow for a smoother uh, supply chain operation. But also, it's around you know, that worker safety and productivity. This is one core area that customers are definitely focused in, and it's a key customer need. So to address these, again, it comes back down to the edge at the bottom and the cloud at the top. We need to either get data or provide data to the edge. And so we have to have those capabilities, and that's where AWS IoT can come into play. But we can also integrate into a lot of other existing equipment overall. But then as we come into the cloud side, is that we've got a lot of capabilities for either how we connect to our devices, how we ingest that data and store it into different types of databases, or as I can show in the top right section, how we can use things such as you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning to do things such as computer vision. So I'll, I'll give you an eye chart here. This is the industrial reference architecture and all of the AWS services and site or um, industrial environment capabilities uh, that cover all of the various use cases. So this, this pretty much covers everything. I'm um, not gonna talk about any of this slide here. Uh, I just wanna give you kind of an idea for how in depth you know, um, AWS industrial is to achieving these types of outcomes. Now, two things that we will be using is you know, IoT Core, which you kind of spoke about, and also Amazon SageMaker. And SageMaker is a set of managed services that help customers to, to build, train, and deploy machine learning models. It provides a web-based uh, integrated development environment for machine learning. 
which is very uh, common and it's a consistent interface that any data scientist is going to know or work with. And it allows them to essentially ingest large amounts of data, do model training with high powered uh, GPU instances, and then be, basically go through all of the debugging and optimization and then tracking the status of all the machine learning models that they've created. And then on the right hand side, it also provides kind of the one-click deployment mechanism that once a machine learning model has been trained, validated, and made ready, is somebody can say ship it, and that thing is then deployed to a numerous devices at the edge. So if you take a look at some of the typical EHS functions, um, you know, industrial hygiene, um, waste management, complex incidents, whatever, any of these what these functions can be achieved from a machine learning capability. But it's probably going to be a combination of these. And this comes into the kind of that analysis paralysis approach where if you've got a lot of different things you want to do and a lot of services to do these, more than likely you don't know where to start and you may not, you know, you may not start at all. You might just simply push this, um, you know, this discussion or decision down the road. So what we'd actually recommend is to pick or focus on one specific use case. In this case, let's, we're going to focus on safety observations. And from there, we can actually identify that we need two sets of services for this. We need that center section for Amazon SageMaker, so the ability to do all of our model training all the way up to deployment. And then and, you know, step number two is AWS IT Greengrass to be able to take that actual trained model and deploy it to the edge. So I took the, industri the AWS industrial reference architecture and kind of broke it down to make it a little bit simpler for what a computer vision architecture looks like. If we start off on the left-hand side of the industrial environment, we're going to have some types of sensors, or in this case, cameras, that are going to be our source of data. These cameras are then going to feed data into a local appliance or system running some software. These systems are going to be running machine learning models and also inference code to basically uh, be able to take in a video stream, take in a frame, and get predictions back. And then it's going to be able to send inference results or messages back into our EHS um, you know, safety staff overall. Then on the uh, right-hand side, we have the AWS Cloud. And this is where our data scientists and engineers start with Amazon SageMaker to essentially go through the hypothesis or you know, the what-ifs and the experimentation. They then go through the training, testing, and deployment of machine learning models. Those models are then put into Amazon S3, our simple storage service. And those uh, model objects are then made available to our edge devices. In the first case, we have AWS IoT Greengrass, which can be notified that a new model has been delivered. It can download that model uh, locally and start to use the newly trained model for its inference. Also, we have other services such as AWS Panorama. And this is an appliance that um, has the same capabilities from, from Greengrass for a machine learning perspective, um, but again, allows us to plug into cameras and to download those objects to S3. And the key thing is for both of those solutions, it can, they can essentially emit or send those inference results back out to our EHS staff so that they can take corrective action or even track things such as an increase or decrease in those uh, worker safety incidents. And it's a couple more words on uh, AWS Panorama because it's, it's kind of a cool product. Um, Panorama is an appliance. So it's something that you can actually buy uh, from AWS. You deploy it on site. And the key thing is you can actually plug it into your existing on-site cameras if you already have them, which can significantly reduce cost and spend if you already have it instrumented. And by using um, partner-selected uh, computer vision applications, and these are ones that can be provided by BigMate, um, Pilot AI, Siemens, or TIBCO, you can actually get out-of-the-box things such as PPE detection, social distance monitoring, or actually create and modify your own computer vision models to be deployed to this. And if you move it from kind of a one-to-one a, a -one type of thing and you want to go to more of a larger deployment, we also have system integrators such as Accenture, Deloitte, uh, Tensor IoT, et cetera, that can help with that um, at-scale deployment of AWS Panorama. So just to summarize what we covered in this section here, is that AWS for Industrial is uniting both partner and AWS solutions into a single initiative. And all of these uh, solutions and initiative are really focused around that artificial intelligence and machine learning approach for doing things. Um, other ones, you know, other aspects are covered from like um, you know, operational data, but the things that we're covering here really are AI ML 
focused. Um, even though we're going to we're only focusing on one aspect, is that AWS for Industrial does cover all of the key needs that we've seen customers come and ask for when it comes to an industrial IoT perspective. And just to, to reiterate, is that not only you know this isn't this suitable just for greenfield environments, but if you already have an existing environment, you can overlay AWS for Industrial on top of that existing environment and get uh, better insight and inference overall. So with that, um, we've, we, I spoke a lot. Let's actually get into a, a demonstration here. So I'll, let me go ahead and set up what the demonstration is going to be from an architecture perspective. And this is even a reduced one from the um, computer vision architecture. And on the left-hand side is we have our data scientist that's working inside a SageMaker. And we'll see that from the console perspective. And that they're going through and working with an object detection framework to create a model. Uh, they're also creating a PPE trained model. And then we're actually deploying this to a local environment, AWS IoT Greengrass, on the right hand side. Uh, from Greengrass's perspective, it'll only be working with a camera. But in this particular case, we're, we're actually going to be using a, um, a video that I created ahead of time to do the camera input so that you can see what you know, the, the video is. And then we're going to see what the object detection looks like for what we call a non-PPE trained model. So this is going to be a, a base model that just has some general categories or classifications. And then what it looks like once we've retrained the model for PPE. And this kind of demonstrates as we're going from one phase of worker safety to another of how we can make those changes. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and open up the console and get started. Let's first look at our simulated worker environment, which will be the source video file that I just started playing. This short video is selected segments of a worker safety video provided by Resonant Pictures, illustrating different examples of PPE. The safety video is produced to educate new construction workers about job site safety, but some of the camera angles and the depth of field of camera shots will highlight things a data scientist needs to take into consideration for training a vision-based model. Both of the models we trained were run against the same footage, so you can see what the output looks like between the two separate models. Having seen the source video, let's take a look at what we do, where we do machine learning in AWS. I'll stop the video and open the SageMaker console in AWS. As previously mentioned, Amazon SageMaker is where all machine learning services are made available for data science. Services include the ability to annotate images at scale with ground truth, automate packaging and training of models, and also provide an interactive environment to test what if scenarios using SageMaker notebook instances. A SageMaker Notebook instance is a fully managed EC2 instance that comes pre-installed with all the machine learning tools and capabilities and presented in an easy-to-use format. And like EC2 instances, data scientists can pick and choose the size of instance based on their task at hand. For instance, when doing an intensive machine learning model training, a GPU instance, such as the one selected here, can be used. When doing less intense operations, a smaller notebook-sized instance can also be used to optimize costs. And also like EC2 instances, notebooks can be stopped and started as needed to further reduce costs. Once a notebook is created and started, you can launch a browser-based interface to interact with it. Here's the interface provided to our data scientist. On the left-hand side is a normal directory browser, and open any of these files will appear in the larger left-hand pane. Right now, I've got two notebooks opened. And this first notebook is a YOLO v5 tutorial. The notebook will have different sections. This first one here is where you can actually put in formatted text to describe what's going on. But then you also have interactive boxes where commands and code can be run. So for instance, I could actually type into here and say something such as print hello world and execute that inside of the notebook instance itself. This particular notebook is a for computer vision a framework called YOLO v5. YOLO stands for you only look once, and it's a mechanism or a framework for detecting multiple objects in a single image. If I scroll down the tutorial to the sample output image, you can see this in operation. You can see that YOLO has detected four different objects, and there's two different classes. One class is person of two objects, the other class is tie of two objects, and it also tells where in the particular image those particular objects can be found. Now, as you go through these tutorials, it's very well laid out to follow into different steps. So you can first start how to validate, then train your model, 
And then finally, visualize the output of the different um, results of the model training overall. And this is where you can think to see what the actual training accuracy or training loss is, examples of actual outputs that were used. And finally, at the very end, you'll see a variety of graphs that do to show the different precision of the actual uh, model in question. And by using these, you can get a better gauge for when a model is fully trained and operating at the accuracy that you want it to be running at. In training the PPE model, I used an existing set of annotated images from a public data set. I placed these data set, or these images in a data set directory. And for each of the images that we have, there's over 100 here, double click into a couple and we'll show you different images that were used. Some of these images, like the one shown here, have no actual PPE shown, while other ones do at smaller resolutions. Well, there might be even larger resolution images overall showing different types of things. So for every one of these corresponding images, there's also a text file that shows where in the image the different information is located. So these labeling files, and I'll open up one here as an example, have different categories. So the first column is essentially what type of uh, classification we have. This is a person, vest, hearing protection, unprotected torso, etc. And then in that particular image, where specifically in the image that particular, um, you know, the bounding box is located. So this provides the machine learning model the details needed to train and validate the model in question. So this particular notebook is the one that I used to train the data set. First, I created a list of the categories or classifications that map to the annotated images. And then I actually ran the training script itself. Now, as you can see from the output, there's a lot of you know, text here that was uh, provided during this, but then it started to run across different epics. Each of these epics is taking a look at a few images at a time, testing the trained images against validated images, and then over time learning how to increase the accuracy of the output. We scroll all the way to the bottom, we'll see that when we got to the 79th run, is that for this particular model, the accuracy of approximately 78% was found, wasn't getting any better, so that they essentially stopped doing the training on this particular model. We'll see the results of what this trained model looks like versus the one of the of a generic one we call COCO, which has just got a generic set of um, categories and classifications used by data scientists to, to get started. This video shows what the output is for the default training that comes with Yellow V5. It's based on general categories, and as you can see, has nothing other than person related to PPE. No other categories come up that are PPE related. This model is used to validate the training environments when you first get started with the machine learning model just to verify everything is operating correctly. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the video for a quick second here and show you what some of the categories are that come up. Um, as mentioned, we saw in the other one of uh, the sample image where we had a person in a tie. Here we saw a person. It's one of the more common uh, classifications for what we call the COCO uh, data set. But as you see here, it thinks that there's an actual suitcase, which we know is not to be true, a skateboard. And if I scroll a little bit further in, um, even a cell phone. So in this particular model, it's good to get an idea for what an annotation looks like uh, coming out of this. And then we're going to compare this against what our PPE trained model looks like. One thing I do want to show is at the very end, an example where we have this person that is digging uh, down here inside some earth, and it's coming up either with a bird or, in some instances, a person showing this. And we'll take a look at how this kind of compares and contrasts to the PPE uh, related model we'll show next. So, our PPE related model here, before I actually get started, I want to bring our uh, Point something out. You can see that the annotations that originally started uh, now match what was created in the model. So we have uncovered torso, we have safety vest, and above you would see also a person in hard hat. You can also see that in this very first image, we've got conflicting classes. We have an uncovered torso and a safety vest, which we know is contradictory. This is a good indicator that more images are needed to increase the accuracy of the model, um, or at least provide a better probability of the values to act upon. But this is actually part of the normal process for refining a model, 
is which is to identify these areas of contradiction or low probability and that add additional images to help refine the training overall. So let me go ahead and start this up. And we'll see now is that for a lot of these images, we're getting our classifications that we're expecting, safety helmet, safety vest, etc. And I'll kind of pause here and we can you see this kind of in operation. But I scroll back just a little bit actually. And when this person was putting on their helmet, there's a good example where as we have their safety uh, visor in front of their safety vest, we now have a better indication that this might be uncovered torso. Now, this is going to be normal for a close-up camera, but if we had a camera that was further back and had a better view in this person, it wouldn't block so much of the, the vest in question. So camera placement is also very important for doing computer vision models. Scroll forward to another one here. Here's another in uh, interesting one. Another close-up of a person, and in this case, putting on a respirator. One of the classifications we actually haven't um, trained for. So there's a higher probability this might be a welding mask. We know that it's not. So if we actually did training for a respirator, that would give the model more of a probability that this is a true respirator and reduce the overall welding mask probability in general. But if I scroll just a little bit further on this one to have a wider view, you can see at this point, it's now actually more accurate. We do have a person, an uncovered torso, and also an uncovered head. But because the, um, the field of view or the, um, the focus goes all the way to that person in the back, we actually can pick up images that are further away. And so this is a good example of how YOLO can operate with objects that are up close and also ones that are in the back. And finally, I'll go back over to that last portion where we had that person digging. As you can see here, our trained image for PPE, and we can obviously see PPE on this person, wasn't picked up at all. The previous model at least picked up a person or burdensome situations. But right here, we have absolutely no indication for that, which as a data scientist would lead me to want to include additional images of people from the rear with obstructions in front of them with safety equipment that, that's on. So with an accurately trained model located in S3, we can now use SageMaker Edge Manager to deploy the model to one or many edge devices in the field. So SageMaker Edge Manager allows us to reference a model located inside of S3. We actually use a tool called SageMaker Neo, which is a deep learning runtime to optimize the model to run a constrained devices at the edge. And then we provide a set of software at the edge, and we'll go through that in a few seconds, to actually automate the full process of training the model in the cloud, notifying edge devices that new models are available, and then providing the, the model to those to start doing the inference. Those inferences can then be pushed back up to the cloud, and that could go into our um, you know, EHS staff, or it can be actually used to do local inference and even op you know, operation for local staff that might be on site. One other thing that I wanted to call out that we saw in the demo was this a little bit more around uh, Amazon SageMaker Edge Manager. Um, the console basically, you know, this shows the steps, you know, one, two, three, but I want to kind of put together a diagram which shows us a little bit more detail. So again, you know, just like in the demo, our data scientist is working in SageMaker. Step one is to create the model. Step two is that when the model is fully trained and available, we want to put that into our S3 object bucket. And then uh, we want to notify our edge device. And this is the one that's actually running the SageMaker Edge Manager software, which can run natively on machines or as part of AWS IT Greengrass to download the new model, potentially any updates to our application, and start doing inference. Now, for this particular one, we're showing um, a wind turbine instead of our PPE that we, we just shown. But it also kind of demonstrates that not only can you do inference locally and send the results to the edge, but you can actually make all that information available in a local dashboard that a wind turbine farm operator or our EHS staff could actually use for the locations that they're, they're at overall. So how do you kind of get started with all of this? Um, from a machine learning perspective or model training, um, focus on one model per use case or potentially per location. If you've got the, the dimension of a project like our, our a natural gas extraction site with our five phases, we may have five different models for that. 
or it may be that you're doing some type of common uh, type of task, which you're doing this in disparate environments where you may want a model per location. Uh, one thing I kind of didn't call out is that um, having a lot of images is a, is, a, is a key thing for accuracy. If you have approximately 1,500 images per classification, and these images should be from different angles, viewpoints, uh, distances, and even images that have nothing in them as kind of a, a false positive or false negative indicator, is that will get you better accuracy for each of those classifications. And then you want to basically go through the, the, a virtuous cycle of, of model training. So basically, have the capability to save images or video from those edge devices, just native, unannotated video or images that you can then put up into the cloud and use as a source for the next training exercise that you want to do. One of the features of uh, Amazon SageMaker is Ground Truth. This is the ability to take in those unannotated video, videos and images and create a job that's then either given out to your staff or if the information is not proprietary, can even be outsourced uh, to other AWS customers uh, via the Mechanical Turk to actually do the full annotation for all those images. That significantly reduces the amount of time that a data scientist uh, needs to go through image after image, 1500 per classification, doing these annotations before they can actually use this information. So it's definitely a force, force multiplier for getting annotated data overall. Then with all of that data, you can retrain, retrain and validate your model results getting to the higher map or accuracy scores. And you can continue to do this over and over until you've basically gotten rid of any type of model drift or have gotten an accuracy to where you, your levels that you want. However, I'll kind of you know, also take that back and say that don't always focus on the highest accuracy overall. And this is kind of the 80-20 rule, is that the last 20% of accuracy is gonna consume 80% of your time. If you have either a model size, you know, based on the size of an image that you're looking to detect, or an accuracy score that you've achieved, and that's good enough for the, that particular uh, operation, stop there. You can actually use your SageMaker notebook to actually to, to make indications for why you stopped training at a particular level, put in your, your thoughts and hypothesis, and for the later date you require, you, you decide you need to have a higher accuracy, you can do so. To also get started is please um, leverage you know, your AWS resources. Um, every customer out there has got a dedicated solution architect to your account or to your industry. And solutions architects such as myself can come in, help understand your use case, and give you better guidance for where to go next for this so that you're essentially not starting you know, with a, um, a blank map in your hand and no idea for where the destination is. We also have different types of solutions labs, workshops, and other types of um, material to help educate you on the use of different AWS services. And also to, you know, if you want to see the art of the possible, to actually see proof of concepts in operation. I'd also say that our professional services organization, or ProServe, are great for helping accelerate adoption or getting started. So they can take you from zero to working POCs or even production code um, even if you don't have a dedicated or a trained up data science and uh, you know, IoT type of staff overall. And also from our partner network. We spoke about our partners from AWS for Industrial, but we also have partners that uh, span the entire gamut for IoT and machine learning capabilities. Um, these could be cust uh, uh, partners such as Bassler that provide computer vision cameras with actually built-in machine learning capabilities, all the way up to those that make gateways or industrial appliances overall. But again, uh, please reach out to your AWS account team and they can help get you in contact with the partners that you need for your portion of the journey overall. And sometimes you actually might even use partner solutions that are built on AWS, but aren't using AWS native services. If you've got a large amount of devices that you're managing, PTC ThingsWorks might be a bet the, an appropriate platform this. Or you may want to take advantage of Tensor IoT's Smart Insights framework which allows you to have all your devices out there and using this framework, get a lot of insights that you don't have to actually do the coding, which are using the Tensor IoT capabilities overall. So let's kind of you know, wrap up um, our presentation so far. Is you know, consider that worker safety is gonna be a continuum over time. It's not gonna be static at any one time. Things are gonna change even if the environment doesn't, but more than likely, as your company progresses or projects progress, worker safety is going to change during different phases. 
To, to get started, use reference architectures and offerings such as AWS for Industrial. These really do help you uh, you'll come out of the, the, the block with a set of uh, capabilities and not having to go through uh, a lot of discovery mechanisms overall. Um, again, focus on a specific use case. You know, instead of you're trying to uh, boil the ocean, is you know, get that one use case, perform it, and then iterate and either make that one better or expand that out to other capabilities that you can use for your industrial workloads. And again, please engage your AWS account team from either an IoT perspective or machine learning to get those best practices and approaches for that how you want to uh, work your, or do your workloads. And then in closing, closing, you can absolutely do this. Doing the actual training for that demonstration of a model took me approximately three days total time from start to finish. And that was discovering the YOLO v5 approach, creating the models, finding data sets, and putting this together. Um, a lot of this does seem to be very complex and, and out there, but these are, are definitely things that anybody with um, your know, skills with AWS or an understanding for how to kind of approach machine learning can definitely achieve. So I'd like to thank you again for taking the time to, to go through this presentation. And at this point, I'll take questions.